welcome to this edition of our town hall here at the Straz Center for the Performing Arts. I'm Fred Johnson, artist in residence and a community engagement specialist, along with our co-host, Ms. Alice Santana, the Director of Education and Community Engagement here at the Straz Center. And we are honored this month to honor our veterans to really lift up the banner of honoring those who have served their country so diligently in all of the military services. This, of course, November is the month where we honor veterans and we are really, really happy to have this opportunity to acknowledge all of our veterans and the huge commitment. And as some of you know, and maybe many of you don't, the Strass Center for the Performing Arts is very, very committed to working with our military, both active, retired, our veterans in our community. Tampa Bay happens to have one of the largest um, military communities in the country. And the, the Strass Center is very, very committed to supporting uh, our and honoring and celebrating uh, those who have uh, made the commitment to serve our, our, our country um, in the military. And I'm really, really honored this evening to uh, have three guests who are near and dear uh, to the, the, the world of art and also uh, the world of veteran engagement. Um, General Nolan Bivens, um, who is kind of our keynote speaker this evening, uh, is a gentleman who uh, served so honorably in the United States Army and also serves every day now as being one of the leading voices in the United States, working with the Department of Defense, working with the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs and Americans for the Arts in a conversation about the importance of art as a real modality to help returning veterans find their way back into a reintegration with the community, find their way back to health, to health uh, working directly with scientists and doctors with VA hospitals, as well as community centers like the Straz Center to really use art as a way to help um, our veterans and their families heal. Um, I'll do a broader introduction of Dr. Uh, of General, General Bivens in a minute, but General Bivens, welcome to the town hall. It's an honor also to have Mr. Manuel Manny Guevara uh, to our panel today. Uh, again, a, a gentleman who has become a really, really important part of the work that we do at the Strass Center with Creative Forces which I've spoken to you all about before, which is that initiative, which General Bivens is an integral part of. Um, Manny, uh, US Army veteran uh, and works as a manager uh, in a, a program with the Crisis Center of Tampa Bay that specifically uh, supports and serves our veteran community. Um, and also uh, really honored to introduce you to Ms. Nikita Wilson, uh, again, U.S. Army veteran, uh, another leader and one of those voices in terms of really lending support to our veteran community um, before, sadly, she left us in the Tampa Bay area and moved to Orlando. She worked with the Crisis Center as well and worked closely with Manny. She is an amazing vocalist, an amazing artist, and just an amazing human being. So we are really, really honored to have the three of you here as we delve, ladies and gentlemen, into a conversation about veterans who come from the diaspora, veterans who come from the, uh, the descendants of folk who uh, traveled from uh, Africa uh, to the New World. So this is a real opportunity for us to have a conversation about the history of and the and the dedication and commitment of uh, members of the black and brown community in support of this country. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, veterans from our First Nation community. Um, in fact, most of the uh, periodicals that uh, talk about the Native American community say that there is a huge a large proportion of folk from the First Nation community who find their way into service in the military. 
um, and in our overarching conversation about the challenges that we face in America, it is always important for us to acknowledge, celebrate, and remember the members of our First Nation community because they were the foundation of this country before folk came from another place and kind of shifted the balance here. So honoring all veterans who have served, honoring our First Nation veterans and entering into a conversation now about those of us who come from the descendants of, of, the, of the other part of the world from Mother Africa and all of its Caribbean connectors and no greater person to that overview than Roland Bivens. So Bivens, I'll, I'll take the liberty of, of reading some of, some of your bio so that folk will have a better sense of who you are. Uh, General B Bivens currently serves as the chair of the National Leadership Advisory Council, the National Initiative for Arts and Health in the Military, and is senior policy fellow arts and military with Americans for the Arts. Leader Six is his organization, provides management, consulting, professional services, and products to commercial, nonprofit, and government customers to improve leader and organizational uh, performance. As chair of the National Leadership Advisory Council, he both he's both a, a thought leader and advocate for the benefits of the arts to serve members and veterans suffering the invisible wounds of war, particularly traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. He's testified before the House Appropriations Interior Subcommittee, served as military advisor to um, Healing Wars, theatrical dance production, PBS Crafts in America, service episodes, Smithsonian Institute's um, Haiti Cultural Recovery Project and Creative Forces National Endowment for the Arts, Military Healing Arts Network, brief congressional, congressional staffers, and served as keynote speaker for national nonprofits, business arts councils, and state and arts organizations. So General Bivens understands military service and he understands the importance of arts. A former US Army General Nolan's military service included chief of staff for the US Southern Command, chief operations officer, US Third Army, Army deputy commanding general fourth infantry division, Deputy Director, Regional Operations for CPA, CJTF7 Headquarters, Iraqi Freedom, U.S. Joint and Army Pentagon staffs, and U.S. Special Operations Command. Formerly a Vice President for Business Development Sales and Washington, D.C. Operations with a major defense corporation, General Bivens also advises companies in the defense sector. General Bivens, welcome to the town hall, and we really, really look forward and are excited about getting your perspective. Uh, I've had the opportunity to hear some parts of this and it was inspirational to me. And I know that the members of our community will really, really appreciate what you have to offer. So thank you for being here with us. Well, Fred, thank you so very much. Uh, and I would like to make sure I compliment you for the great work that you're doing. And certainly without that in the part of the country that you live in, we would not see the the continued uh, recognition of our veterans in the way that you are. So kudos to you for what you're doing there. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to be a partner with you in this effort. Um, so uh, thanks to everyone. Also um, to Manny and uh, Nikita, uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be with you tonight. I'm the one that's probably gonna learn by virtue of being with you all. And I'd like to thank you for your service, uh, particularly with the Crisis uh, Center and, and those other activities. Um, Alice, uh, definitely want to thank uh, thank you for uh, being the showkeeper for us tonight. Because obviously, without you, there would not be um, any um, substantive. And also, I'd like to thank Kate and Jessica for making sure that those in our disadvantaged population are able to to participate as well. Thanks to all of you. Um, I'll jump right in, pretty much, and uh, I will probably try not to bore you too much with too much history. But I'll just tell you a little bit up front that there is a historical context to this. So if you get through that portion of it with me, I think you will see the value of, of why it's important, I think, to, at this moment in time, uh, share this uh, context that Fred has set up. You know, 2020 has been a very a watershed year for us in many, many ways um, for the country. And so when Fred had mentioned this to me, I, I kind of stepped back and said, you know, it really is probably very appropriate then 
given all that has happened throughout the year to, to look at this veteran year within the context of the year, right? I mean, we talk about veterans and we certainly celebrate each other quite a bit. Um, and I think it's very, very important to, to kind of consider uh, the veteran idea this year, particularly 2020, uh, for, for what we've seen. And uh, so the topic of that is very, very important. With that introduction, I really want to make sure I say uh, happy uh, Veterans Day to, uh, to the 18 million veterans that are serving and have served uh, uh, this country honorably. And I want to say I'm particularly uh, today uh, based on a couple of populations. You know, there's almost 500,000 uh, veterans remaining from World War II, and I really want to say, uh, you know, happy Veterans Day to you guys. But also want to say happy Veterans Day to that population of 1.7 million female service uh, veterans who, by all accounts, is the growing dem demographic uh, within our veteran population. You know, the, the, our females are scheduled to be about 17% of our entire population by the year 2040. That's a very important point. Uh, hopefully I'll come back to that later. This, the other uh, portion I'd like to say happy uh, Veterans Day to is, um, which is the largest cohort right now of veterans, and that's the Vietnam era veterans. There's about 6.4 million of you guys out there that I would say happy Veterans Day too. And the portion that I'd like to also uh, remember here, and we don't hear about this quite a bit, is that the second largest cohort of veterans are those who served during peacetime. And that's about 4 million of us. And finally, I'd like to say it to the youngest generation of veterans, those who served since post 9-11, and um, thank you also for your service as well. Uh, could you get slide two, please? As I stated, um, 2020 has been a very watershed year and a lot has happened. And uh, I think it's very appropriate to look at this topic today on Veterans Day, and I appreciate Fred asking me to do this, uh, specifically because of the, the strong resurgence that we've seen throughout our country uh, regarding race relations. And for the most part, that one of the themes that I'll talk about has to do with the fact that what has happened in the military has largely followed the trends of what was happening in larger society. So it's very important. But the second reason is that we see now the Department of Defense and a lot of the services have reinvigorated their focus on equity and equality, which is, uh, Think which makes it very, very uh, interesting to do that as well. I always like to, to say what the message is up front. The bottom line out of all of what I say as I go through this discussion today is this notion that the presence of, of minorities within our uh, military, uh, they have fought in every battle that this country has known. Uh, they may not have always gotten the recognition that they wanted, but they still came to the fight. And that's why I kind of coined this notion that it's building strength through diversity under fire. And that's the way I'd like to kind of proceed with the, the discussion today. Next. I'm going to do this discussion uh, over a pretty large period of time, but it's going to be a survey. It's going to be a big sweep over the top. Uh, but I want to do that so it sets the context that, that you know, we have probably in the military been leading our country in many ways in this area of race relations. And, and we sometimes don't look at it in this holistic or historical uh, context, you know, particularly going back to the colonial period uh, to see how you know, we have in fact been on this journey a long time and we've grown and developed along the way, starting from the American Revolution all the way through the contemporary uh, periods of time that the individuals are serving in. So what I'd like to do is I go through, I'll pop through uh, uh, these particular conflicts and I'll talk about some of the realities that uh, were around uh, regarding race relations in each one of those periods of time. I'll look at it um, in terms of policy, the practices of what was actually being done and also in terms of what leadership was saying at that particular point in time. The first period of time we'd like to discuss is the colonial period. Um, years before the revolution actually started, there was a requirement for every male fit to carry a weapon to be a member of the, the local militia. 
And during this period of time, believe it or not, race was not really a criterion for membership. Uh, but then uh, around the 1600s, as the enslaved population increased and the reports of, of slaves uprising began to spread and states such as Virginia began to enact laws excluding uh, blacks from being provided arms and ammunition. And as a result of that, ultimately, there were very few who served in, in the militia directly. And this also was relevant to Native Americans and to mulattoes and many of the African uh, descent uh, population. Then when we moved into the American Revolution, it's interesting to, to note that when George Washington assumed command uh, of the Continental Army in 1775, the adjutant general uh, who, in his message to the recruiters made the comment, and I quote, not to accept any deserter from the ministerial army or a stroller, Negro or a vagabond. But however, by the end of 19, uh, 1775, numerous issues, including personnel shortages, forced George Washington to reverse his ban on the use of, of black soldiers. And states such as Massachusetts and Rose Island allowed enslaved Africans to enroll in their, their service. Uh, the Navy, for example, uh, black sailors served in the revolutionary gunboats. A Negro captain named Mark Starlin of Virginia, who was a hero and, and commanded the ship Patriot, uh, despite of his battle record and successful service, he was re-enslaved after his master, to his original master at the end of the war. By the end of the American Revolution, there were approximately 5,000 blacks who fought and participated in over 50 battles. Uh, a few years later after that, Congress enacted what's referred to as the Militia Act. And that act basically forbid uh, anyone other than free white males to serve in uh, the militia or military. And interestingly, a note I'll make here is that the Marine Corps, even at this time in 1798, adopted a written literal policy that forbidden the enlistment of Negroes and Indians within the Marine Corps. If we move on now to the War of 1812, we see now, uh, like in the previous case, um, the War of 1812 required states to fill large military forces and blacks were enlisted only when a shortage of whites uh, rendered it necessary. Both Americans and British uh, military leadership, however, offered freedom as a promise for enlistment to enslaved blacks during the war. However, most were returned to their own owners at the end of the war. Blacks were told their service was no longer needed and the US Army issued an order stating that no Negro will it be received a recruit of the army. The Civil War, as we move to that period of time, is interesting because we have to really look at it from both the Union side and also the Confederate side. At the beginning of the Civil War, uh, Blacks were not accepted in the Union Army. Due to heavy casualties, though, in 1863, the Bureau of Colored Troops was established. And uh, that led to the first incident of a high mortality rate among Blacks. It was like 40%, largely because didn't have the medical care and, and uh, equipment that many of the others had. Of course, it was high mortality all around for everyone. The Union Navy experienced massive personnel shortages um, because they, as you know, expanded from 600 and, uh, from seven to six ships to about 671. Mostly serving in Texas, however, there were Hispanics who also participated in the effort, um, both, uh, both sides of the Mason-Dixon line and over 20,000 Indians joined both sides of the conflict. Ironically though, for the Confederate military, they saw the, and recognized the use of black uh, servicemen earlier than the Union. Uh, they were faced with personal shortages right from the start. However, um, the treatment of blacks within the, the Confederate army and also for Union captured soldiers was very, very difficult. And oftentimes they were, uh, shot on site and or in some cases buried alive. Then uh, I'll go and talk about the Indian campaign as well as the Spanish war kind of in the same breath. The Indian campaign after the Civil War, um, the retention of, of black soldiers uh, was done and, and they were brought on to participate in um, the 9th, 10th, 
Cavalry and the 24th and the 24th Infantry Regiments. They built roads, they repaired telegraph wires and escorted a lot of different uh, wagon trains and other settlers and things of that sort. This is the first time we really see one of the leadership uh, dimensions that I talked about earlier. Um, white officers at this particular time expressed uh, their reservations about blacks in the military. And for example, George Custer refused a promotion to Lieutenant Colonel uh, with the 9th Cavalry uh, because it would have required him to lead uh, black soldiers. Uh, interestingly, at this time, the only way that an, uh, a person of color could participate um, as an officer was to attend the, uh, the military academy. And we had three blacks to graduate holding a regular army commission uh, at this time. And, and yet it was four to six years later before another one actually graduated from the academy at West Point. The, the black 9th and 10th cavalry, as you know, became well known. They were particularly uh, feared and intrigued by their uh, their dark skin among the Native Americans, and hence they received the name as Buffalo Soldiers, many of you already know that. At the end of this campaign, uh, the Army Reorganization Act once again um, uh, established an Indian Scouting Corps, many may not know that, but it was dismantled in 1943, largely because they felt it competed with jobs and opportunities for white servicemen. The Spanish War is also unique. Uh, we get another leadership component uh, from the Spanish War because at the end of that war, um, the uh, Philippine Islands along with Cuba, Puerto Rico and the Guam, as you all know, um, were made parts of the United States. The War Department felt that black servicemen and women were particularly fitted for this uh, fight because of their Caribbean service, Caribbean uh, history. Uh, black regiments came into to the rescue of uh, Theodore Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. Uh, interestingly enough, though, voicing his racial, uh, voicing the attitude of the racial climate at that particular time, uh, the famous Rough Rider Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt openly criticized black troops for being particularly dependent on their white officers and called them laggards who tended to drift to the back of the formations. Uh, in the war period between uh, that, we kind of moved now to World War I. Um, during this time, the military began categorizing servicemen as either white, black, or other. And I mentioned that because it's important then because we can get a little bit more history about who actually participated in these different campaigns. The information is scattered, but we do know uh, that with Hispanic Americans participated and did fight in World War I at this, as a result of that categorization. Filipinos who incident in the Navy during this time uh, served, but they also only made it exclusively as stewards. Although they were still not considered American citizens, uh, Native Americans also participated. About 17,000 fought in World War I, and another 6,509 were even drafted against their own uh, choice. Now, Blacks, however, were the first ones to rush to the recruiting station uh, during World War I, uh, around 19, uh, 1917. They sought to volunteer in all the different services, but were not accepted initially. A month later, the Sele Selective Service Act um, did um, exclude Blacks and over 3 million, uh, include Blacks rather, and they included over 3 million uh, being registered. However, uh, Blacks still continue to be barred from the Marine Corps and the policy and branches and practices, uh, only about 380,000 to 400,000 Black soldiers were members of services such as regiments serving as stevedores, drivers, and engineers. Um, I'd like to also point out that those who experienced combat were assigned to all Black units, particularly the 92nd and the 93rd Division as you recall, the 92nd Division served under uh, white uh, American officers in France, and Pershing had assigned four of the regiments from that 92nd to the French, and they fought under the French leadership, um, particularly uh, four of those regiments, and they were highly regarded and praised by the French. The 369th Regiment in particular uh, was one of the regiments in the Allied Expeditionary Force. Uh, they were the first to reach the Rhine uh, River 
And in one instance, they served over 181 consecutive days of battle, which was a, a, a length of time that broke many records at that particular point. The, the, I'll move now to talk about the period between the wars. You would say, why would you want to discuss that? Well, the period between the wars proved to be very interesting because that's when we saw a lot of the policy and, and um, views that were developed that particularly standed across the, the military for some time. Uh, after World War II, as you remember, the, the military went into this great transforming of the army, particularly uh, to a peace status. The policymaking positions believed that blacks in, in the combat uh, and did not really allow that opportunity for them to be commissioned extensively. The conclusion drawn by uh, blacks uh, were of less military value than whites. Uh, and interestingly, the Sil Central Staff College had did a study. And it's interesting uh, that that study became the format for a lot of the attitudes that were developed. Uh, the study and many others like it would be the main source for shaping the Army's policy toward future utilization of black officers and soldiers. And I'll cite a particular one that came out of the Army War College. It was a report that was issued. Uh, the title of it was The Use of Negro Manpower in War. And it, it was very raw in its uh, interpretation of the, of the participation. In one instance in the report, it made the comment, and I quote, the psychology of the Negro based on heredity derived from mediocre African ancestors cultivated by generations of slavery is one of is one reason from which we cannot expect to draw leadership material. Now, I cite that only to point out that it was this period of time that a lot of the attitudes about where and how they would serve was actually formulated. Uh, this report stood around for a long time. Um, the Marine Corps continued to exclude blacks and the Navy did not allow sailors any, the, the blacks who served in the Navy, they were not allowed to have any uh, ratings um, beyond that, you know, kind of uh, messengers and, and that aspect. Uh, they did allow them to, uh, to, did not allow them to need to advance in the petty officer ranks, uh, largely because they feared they would not be able to lead white soldiers. World War II uh, was another shedding point for us in that aspect. Uh, the War Department prior to the war had forbid um, discrimination, but the service virtually ignored it. That's a positive point to, to make out. And I will just highlight how many times over the period, uh, the policies were put in place, but the services really did not choose to follow them. Uh, before Pearl Harbor, uh, Blacks constituted about 6% of, uh, of the Army and had only about five officers uh, that were general officers at that point in time. Um, and three of them were chaplains. Um, interesting. Uh, they experienced very little combat. However, there was those who did like the 76-1 Black Panther Tank Battalion, um, come out fighting was their motto. The average lifespan of a separate tank battalion in the front lines of Europe was 10 to 15 days. The 761st fought for more than 183 consecutive days from France to Austria. The unit was nominated for the presidential unit citation on six different occasions and finally received the award in 1978. Then we know on June 25th, 1941, President, President uh, Roosevelt issued an executive order. It was referred to as 8802, which established the fair employment practices, which basically said there was to be no uh, non-discrimination in all branches of the armed services. Uh, it continued, however, in various forms. And in 1940, 40, uh, 42, that period of time, uh, the Marine Corps uh, began recruiting blacks for the first time since 1778. And that's interesting to point out uh, in terms of the timeline. Um, the last point I'll make about this period of the war was the fact that um, minority troops were actually under President Harriet says Truman, the deseg desegregation of the armed services occurred in July of 1948. Other uh, aspects of, of the war saw the inclusion of over 200,000 uh, Filipino soldiers that fought under Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines. Um, 
even though the order declared the fair treatment in terms of equality and treatment for all persons in the armed services, um, it still continued in various places. The, at the, the end of the war, though, saw the largest demobilization that we had seen, and many of the individuals were removed from active duty. The Korean conflict, however, is interesting in the sense that President Truman had declared a national emergency and he called for the buildup of 3.5 million uh, soldiers uh, and servicemen. And what that created was uh, a real opportunity and for the first time, the training of uh, minority soldiers with, with white soldiers directly. You know, the basic training camps were integrated and many of them, however, after leaving the, the basic training camp, went out to uh, segregated units. Uh, and then in 1954, the Department of Defense formally announced that the, arm, the Army had disbanded all of its uh, segregated units. So that's an important aspect of what happened during the Korean conflict. As we move to the Vietnam War and a much more closer time period of what we can see in history, the, the thing that I wanted to highlight here is that it was really driven by a lot of the turmoil that was happening in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and, and if you imagine now the progress that had been made in the military uh, prior to the 60s, uh, a lot of integration had occurred. And then so when the trauma of the 60s and 70s came out, it created a lot of turmoil inside of the military. Um, the military basically had believed that desegregation would solve the problems that they had in the military based on the executive order of President Truman. Uh, but the thing that was missing there was the idea of, of, of actual eco treatment. There were race riots that developed throughout for the military from stateside to overseas uh, uh, locations uh, throughout this period of time. And the basic arguments and the basic things were around promotions, job assignments, and career development. There were also off post housing uh, challenges that many of the, the minority service members had at that particular point in time. The Department of Defense then started developing institutions to look at racism more directly. Uh, one of those institutions was the Defense Race Relations Institute. Um, and, uh, and I'm very, I need to say at this point in time, very um, uh, much to talk to their, their praise because a lot of the research that I was able to take came from that organization. So it's making a contribution there. As we move into the contemporary period, the last part of this chart, um, I wanted to maybe just basically say that we all would agree that overt racism and racial discrimination generally does not exist in the armed services. And that way we've led the nation in many regards. Opportunity advancement uh, have been made uh, extensively. Uh, in many ways, uh, I often share with a lot of my friends that when I was actually retired from the military and came back out into the civilian world in many ways, I saw myself going back 10 years personally at my own personal experience level. Um, one of the things that I would say that indicates the progress is we've seen the, the application of fair treatment in the area of awards and recommendation. A lot of uh, black units and organizations and individuals have been recognized for the, the incredible her heroism that they just demonstrated in World War II and other battles and they've been recognized those in the, in the more contemporary period. For example, as you all know, President Bill Clinton recognized seven African-Americans for Medal of Honor based on their uh, performance in World War II uh, during his period of time of service. Overall, the climate uh, in this period of time that we refer to as the contemporary, uh, many of the, the things have centered around a fair and equitable treatment disparities in the types of awards and recommendations given, uh, the continuous idea of thinking that blacks were less qualified and minorities in general than whites. Um, some soldiers reported issues of, of racial attention, uh, as you know, throughout these, this contemporary period. But in general, the DOD and, and services have began and have put in place policies and practices to, to avert that uh, discrimination. So how do you summarize all of this history that I just took you through? Probably should have given you this slide up front, but the idea of the historical experience was one of rejection, recruiting, and then rejection again. And you probably recall as I went through that, the idea was uh, in the absence of war, you, know, you couldn't really participate, but in the need in times of war, they recruited and actually were brought in. 
And then at the end of those conflicts, they were rejected again. I don't think that's the model exactly today, but that does describe the pattern of experience, right? And that leads me to kind of want to maybe share with you uh, and then ask at this particular point in time, you know, well, what is the experience now? You know, we know historically, this is one way that authors have described it, uh, but what has it been? And it made me then say, well, let me look at my personal experience and can maybe share as a closing some of those thoughts with, with you for your, your consideration. My personal journey within uh, the military uh, as a veteran and also as an active service member, I, I think I would use the metaphor of these glass um, uh, pieces here. Uh, and I, I chose this graphic because it kind of demonstrates the aspect that if you were standing on the front side of them, you could really choose which one of the the glass frames that you would look at the world through. And those glass frames might really re represent different experiences, different backgrounds, but really also different individuals looking at the same picture. And, but those frames kind of really formed what I thought and have, have seen to be my experience uh, in, within the military. Uh, it's not an incident of rejection, recruiting and rejection. It, it, we've been fully accepted, we've been fully integrated, but I think it's come down to the personal views of which individuals have of each other. So if you show the next chart, I will uh, take you through what I think kind of was my personal journey. So with this idea that we look through windows at each other, um, my personal journey has kind of been the idea that people have kind of seen me as one of four things uh, initially in my interaction with them. And that has led them to how uh, I responded, how they responded, but how we kind of began to grow together. Um, the center screen is just the fact that we look at each other through lenses. The first lens that, uh, that I found folks looked at me through, uh, if you can just continue to click if you don't mind, it, it'll, it'll come. The window number one was, uh, they looked at me first and foremost as a black man. Um, and if I was able to get past that window, particularly as an officer, because many times after they saw the uniform and saw that I was an officer, I, I kind of moved to another window of perception and that is, well, he's a black officer. And what that brought with it uh, was a lot of the history that I quoted to you, you know, the characterization that was made of black officers during that interwar period was that, you know, they, they couldn't write, they couldn't communicate, uh, lacked initiative, all those things is what's captured in this view of being a black officer. But if I made it past that window, then they would move to a window where they would refer to me as an officer, right? I mean, the idea that I could compete, you'd be competitive performance-wise, uh, they, would, they would see me as an officer. But even in being as an officer, that's a qualifier still, because ultimately, and some of my experiences that I had with my peers, I finally realized that there were those who actually did get to see me in window number four, which is as a man, just like them. And that's where I, I think the evolving aspect of our military is that we, we have to kind of continue to work toward this idea of how we view each other. And I know that there's hope uh, in getting to window four because uh, I think I have been there, I know I've been there, and I think it's there for everyone else. Uh, next, please. And so the final thing I think as we go forward is how do we answer that question of, of which window are we looking at each other through? And I think if we continue to do that, uh, we can do so by continually monitoring the racial climate and, and, and of the military and keeping ourselves abreast to it, making sure that we have leaders that are ready for the kind of change. And I think this is where this year was pretty uh, exceptional in that we now see that there are leaders within the military considering and looking at ways to make sure that equality and equity is continued and advanced. We have to do that. We have to persist in that in spite of disparate treatment uh, in the military ranks. Uh, racial minorities continue to dedicate themselves uh, and be a part and take the oath and swear to support and defend this constitution. We may not have always been uh, recognized for what we did, but we always showed up, we always gave our best, we always made a difference across all uh, ethnicities and colors um, 
And now I think as we move forward, we need to continue to make sure that we do that. To do anything less is not in keeping with the democratic principles that we all as veterans swear to support and defend in the form of our constitution. I hope I didn't belabor you too much, um, but I think it's a, a great opportunity. I'm thankful for Fred for giving me the opportunity to share this with you. And next chart. It Thank really you, for me at bottom line is the idea of building strength through diversity. And for us in the military, we've had to do it under fire. And I think as a result of that, we demonstrate to our country that it is possible, that the hope is there, and we continue to role model the way forward. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this great veteran force called the United States of America. Thanks again to everyone. General Bivens, thank you so very, very much. I so appreciate um, having the opportunity to, to hear this and to, and I, you know, this is my second time hearing it. And every time for me, it's, you know, the, the really, really important thing and you, the way that you kind of ended it is the reality that one of the reasons why we realize it's important to be able to have these town halls is so as a greater community, we can really more deeply come to understand the challenges that are faced in the lives of folk who have been the victims of discrimination. You know, there's a, a lot of conversation in regards to focus on, on black Americans, focus on black and brown Americans. The truth is, you know, in the greater conversation, the dedication to service, the dedication to country, the dedication to moving forward, the dedication to facing challenges and moving onward up and beyond, begin with knowing that there's a higher mountain to climb. And so I think what it's important for all Americans to recognize and understand is that the, the construct of discrimination, the construct of rejection is a barrier that when having to be faced causes you to have to push harder, to go harder, sometimes to take a step back and then take a deep breath and move forward. And this is the legacy of those millions and millions of black and brown folk who have dedicated their lives and dedicated their service. And so many gave their life for the aspiration of freedom in America. And, you know, General Bivens, that structure and that opportunity to walk us through that experience is so, so very important because, you know, you, you, you can't be blamed if you don't know. And so a part of it is to really give people the opportunity to really hear the story to really understand the truth that is encapsulated in this journey of the struggle for freedom and the struggle for, to, up, up, you know, to move beyond discrimination. Um, we move now to, to a, another opportunity to really share in what I believe is a really, really rich point of understanding. Um, you know, there are a lot of anacron anacronyms. Is that what is that what it's called, Alice? Anacronyms, you know, uh, little little phrases. I'm gonna say little phrases in the world. And so there's this this new one that is um, uh, 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 it's black, brown, and and people of color. Oh, black, brown, indigenous, and people of color. And so you know, when we have these conversations, it's a really interesting thing that you know we we have. It's a human construct to create sort of a hue category, right? Um, but you know, one of my dear, 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 dear brothers who I've really grown to to love and to understand and to connect to, you know, um, as a veteran, you know, and and you know, every every time uh, General Bivens, when you spoke about the Marine Corps and how long it took, I just got this little, you know, I got this little twinge in my heart, you know, being a former Marine and being a being a Vietnam veteran, you know, it, it's so true. Uh, um, and I could go on and on and on about uh, some of the struggles that I that I faced uh, in, in the military, but I won't. Um, I want to I want to create the opportunity now, Manny, for you to share with us, you know, uh, you know, when we talk about the diaspora, when we talk about the connection of those descendants of of the kings and queens of Africa who were taken from their country and 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 taken from their land and 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 you know put about the world. Um, one of the one of the places of that landing was the was Puerto Rico, 
And uh, I, I know that that uh, you are my brother from Puerto Rico and that you are uh, uh, a, a, an army veteran. So I wanna give you the opportunity to, to share uh, your experiences, uh, both in the service and then returning to the, to the community. So Fred, thank you. Thank you for the time, but uh, General Bivens, oh my God, I was able to see those that came before me from my island and see when they ins inserted themselves into into the service and through through this whole class if you may oh i was i lifted in my mind but i do have a vivid imagination so uh so what can i tell you about about my experience let me um <clears throat> In previous conversations with uh, Fred, we've talked about um, what it was to be this in 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 the military, and um, I was fortunate not to know the language. Uh, so I jumped uh, straight out of Puerto Rico. So my English was not too good looking. Uh, so I was fortunate not to know the language too well, and um, the other thing I was fortunate about in in a society will always, regardless of where we're at, will always discriminate. In Puerto Rico, it, it wasn't really about the race because we are all so mixed to the point of we're called criollos. Because at one point in time, you couldn't identify what I was because the way I look. How come your hair is kinky, but you got green eyes? What's going on with that? So eventually through times, they, they just said, okay, everybody from here on born in the island, they're criollos. Let's go with that. Um, but uh, in the island, I was poor. So that is the kind of discrimination I lived prior to the military, poor. So like a 18 year old kid who wanted to, to leave the life that was going on back in 93, in, in the island of Puerto Rico and, and, and leave poverty behind. I, I looked for, for a, a better future. And, and this is when I came across the, the military. Um, funny you mentioned general, them three R's there in 93, the, those three R's were still in place because uh, as I'm walking down the street, coming home from school the recruiting stations, they had a task, meet to the grinder. So my recruiters did not have the really an intricate, very high quality jobs for the military. Meet to the grinder, meaning my recruiters task was to get infantrymen, artillerymen, and those kinds. So as I'm walking down the street, I see this, I say, okay, this is what I, I, I don't want to be where I'm at. I, I want to get better. So I signed up to the military and that is a funny story how that happened, but we we'll, won't we'll get to that one. Uh, so I ended up in the military. Uh, as I'm figuring things out, I ended up in a military called uh, field artillery because my recruiter's job was not to get medical doctors enrolled in the military. It was to get meat to the grinders. So I became a field artillery man because I didn't know English. I didn't have a clue what that was, but because I couldn't spell artillery, I thought it was pretty cool. It must be an important job because I don't, I can't spell artillery. Never put emphasis on the word field. So I spent very little time at home. When I got to the military, I'm already thinking, you know, it's going to be good. No one's going to discriminate because I'm poor, because now I have a job and now I have money coming in. And then I learn that in the United States military, they look at me different than they would look at my white colleagues. So I, I'm them if I do and I them if I don't. Back at home, 
I'm discriminated. I come here, I'm discriminated first because I'm poor now because I'm brown. I'm never gonna get away from this. So that was the mentality there. Um, so I did have to learn a lot about different cultures because one who wants to progress, that's what one does, right? One learns others and, and one digs into other cultures to, to, to show, to lead by example, sort of like what the non-commissioned officer corps taught us, lead by example. So I had to learn about all kinds of cultures because I was in field artillery I was exposed to a tremendous amount of, um, I love the, the, the phrase used there, Alfred, the, the first nation community. I, I, was, I was introduced to the first nation community firsthand. I lived in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, I was introduced to the, the African-American culture. I was introduced to the Filipino culture. I was introduced to the Indonesian culture. All of this took place because I was in field artillery. Yes, there was one or two of the other, uh, of the Caucasian culture, but I noticed they were not from Wall Street. They were from places that perhaps, ah, they were in the same shoes I was at one point in time. Uh, but nevertheless, I learned from that. Um, learning the language, learning the culture kind of helped me out move towards the person I am today. Um, so, so I took the systematic uh, approach the military had to, to, to provide me a, a, a career. And, and I used it to my benefit because of it. I've learned of other cultures, what I, what I, what I would like to tell others that are perhaps not as uh, amenable to the idea of different cultures. What I like to tell them is just learn, learn from the cultures. It's a, a funny story before I even went to Iraq. One of the first things I did, I ran and in, 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 in got their divine um, book, whatever, what, I got a Quran to understand the culture because I had to understand more and more. And it helps me understand what the, 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 the population was living to the point of, I was one of the, one of the many that was present at, at the very first ever democratic elections in Iraq. My task was to provide security for the human beings to to cast their votes in in so I'm using that whole systematic I ended up doing this job because systematically there was no recruiters in my town that would that were looking for medical doctors they were looking for meat to the grinder so I used that systematic to learn about my my first nation community, about my Filipino community, about my Jamaican community, about my uh, Indonesian community, all the way up to learn about the Quran. In in in, I use this to create who I am today, and for that I'm grateful. Uh, one funny story, and it goes back to the well, not necessarily the three R's, but to to show I don't know what it looks like today. But to show what in this must have been 2000, um, what, where we were at in the military as it pertains to, to really understanding diversity. So I ended up somehow becoming the battalion equal opportunity non commissioned officer. The reason I got it was because in 2000, uh, in artillery, the, the group of artillery men at that time, um, they're called a section. And the head of the section is called a chief. So I was chiefing a section. And when we got, uh, we were in Thailand and we got a small pass to get a little break to clear up the mind. We, we got a 10, 10 p.m. curfew. And I told my section, so we're going to get in trouble. We're going to get in trouble together. So let's meet here at two in the morning and then we'll come in on post together. And so we did my first sergeant. When we came in, he was standing tall 
waiting because he knew I was going to do one of the like, crazy Sergeant Guevara moves. And punishment was to go through the equal opportunity um, course <laughs> and become the equal opportunity non-commissioned <laughs> officer for the battalion. So yes, back in 2000, we were still doing that. It was my punishment. <laughs> so that's 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 the, the the beauty of it, and 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 I feel is a good approach of grabbing something that perhaps doesn't have a good happy cognitation, the systematic procedures, and just using it to my benefit and learning and moving forward in in in, in showing that you're not gonna stop me. Mm -hmm. I will learn. I will move forward. I went from a young kid who didn't know the language to to being here in the presence of, of General Bivens. Oh my God, go figure that one. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. making it moving forward in spite of, you know, making the best and doing doing it with great dedication. Thank you, Manny, so much. We'll come back because we want to have a spe specific conversation about art, but I'm really, really honored to have Nikita Wilson here with us. Nikita, um, again, uh, you know, diligently served, uh, share with us, your, you know, you have kind of a, 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 a real broad perspective, perspective um, uh, a perspective as a, a, a veteran, uh, a woman veteran and a woman veteran of color. So share with us some of your experience uh, in the military. Thank you so much, Fred. And I also wanna say thank you to General Bivens and to my brother Manny for um, all that you did before me. So people like you all, General Bivens, Manny and Fred, you all helped pave the way for um, me to be able to even join when I did in 2004. But of course, in all of the wonderful things that you all did, there's an aspect of that that would be different and unique to you. And that's like you said, Fred, me being a black woman joining the military. Now I will say, I, going in, I came from poverty as well. And I came from a neighborhood that it was interesting because shortly before I left home, I joined in delayed entry right after graduation. And there was someone that I had a conversation with in my neighborhood. And the gentleman, he's a black guy, and he told me, oh, the man is always trying to hold us down. The white man is always trying to hold us down. And I looked at him and I said, that can't be true. I'm a black woman and I'm about to leave my hometown and do something very different that I've never done before and have new opportunities for me. So I, I'd say that to point out that I just, I came into the army with the mindset that I am not just a stereotype of whatever pains and sufferings we have suffered over the many, many years. I know that they're real and I know that they're happening, but I just believe that all of my ancestors and my family members and the people that surround me, I didn't want them to go through what they went through in vain. And I wanted to be um, like a success story of all that they had endured. So I went in with a positive mindset of I'm gonna give it my all, I'm gonna do my best. I'm gonna see people as being human. I, regardless of skin color, I just went in with that mindset with the heart to see everyone as human and to present myself as such. Um, so that's how I went in. But of course, you know, it's interesting when you make a decision, you can go into it that way. And of course, by 2004, there wasn't a lot of overt racism and things of that sort, but there was a lot of underlying issues because of how individual people felt. I quickly began to learn that we all came from very different walks of life. And that's the thing, we come in and we put on the same uniform and we learn the same things to function in the army, but you don't just take away all that person's previous life experiences and their beliefs and their values and how they see themselves and how they see this black tall woman standing in front of them in uniform. And most of my time in the army, I didn't deal with a lot of you know, tension, but it was more so when I went into positions of leadership. I made it to the rank of staff sergeant, 
um, throughout my 10 years. And it was about year six. Well, no, about year four when I became an E5, a sergeant. So I stepped into a leadership role and I took it seriously because I recognized the importance of having someone else's life that I was responsible for. Even though I wasn't in combat, I still knew that what I said and what I did could significantly affect another person. So again, I went in with my mentality of I am a human dealing with other humans and I'm gonna give it all I've got. And unfortunately there were times where people who didn't want to see my humanity because of whatever their beliefs were, um, they attempted to kind of smother me out or silence me and or either also um, stereotype me. So one stereotype that many Black women in the military kind of try to avoid and tiptoe around is the angry Black woman. And of course, we know that's something that comes up a lot in society as well. And you, you quickly learn how to do different things and maneuver things differently to show people, I'm not that angry Black woman. So you either got one or two things. You got the one like me who did what they felt was necessary to show that I am not the woman that you stereotype me to be. Or you had the other type that was, you're gonna deal with whatever it is that I show you. And that's just something you're gonna have to deal with on your own. And um, it's it was challenging to walk into rooms and to see someone trying to figure out like, who is she? Is she going to come in here and, you know, tell everyone off, and, you know, with the neck rolling and all of those, you, you, you know what I mean? So <laughs> you can see that. And then I walk into a room and I'm genuinely smiling and not even that I wake up six in the morning going to PT formation and I'm the most ju jubilant person outside and everyone else is still waking up rolling crust out of their eyes and I that's I just brought the joy and for some people that was it's like that bothered them and I could tell to the point to where at a certain point towards the end of my military career I did everything that I could to try to support different soldiers especially if they had complaints within the unit and a bunch of soldiers came to me with issues with the current leaders. And um, they were all um, not people of color. So they came to me and I treated it just like a human situation. But once I started speaking to the leaders in different positions for support, it was turned on me to say that they were trying to accuse me of treason. And it, was, it, it made no sense. And if it wasn't for having a leader who knew me and was willing to hear me out, I would have ended up not being able to leave the military when I should have. I would have ended up being, you know, tried and it could have gone a lot further than it needed to. And I bring that up because a lot of times things are, were avoided, issues, big issues were avoided because there was someone whether it was a person of color or just a person with the right heart to see me as a human who was willing to stop the, the madness and say, no, let me see what's really going on here. And so it was things like that because if you've got enough people that have that corrupted mindset about me when I walk in a room, regardless of what the truth is, they can actually further whatever their desires are. And, and I'm thankful and very grateful to the many, many people, the many leaders, the different people in different positions who were able to look at me and either say, I know her and I, I'm going to see what the real situation is. I won't let anyone just tell me what she did. I'm going to really investigate the situation. That came through a lot for me. So I, and I, in these situations where the racism or the, you know, the singling out happened, that I can proudly say was a small aspect of my military experience because overall, those 10 years, 
I was able to reach the rank of staff sergeant without being discriminated against. I was able to serve as a sexual assault and sexual harassment victim advocate. And I was able to provide one-on-one -on -one support to so many soldiers, so many. And I attribute that to every soldier of color and every female soldier that came before me who was able to show that there is a different way to do things and give a better picture and to pave the way for someone like me to come in from 2004 to 2014. So I'm grateful to say that while there are some people who still have their own personal views, that I was able to go in with the mindset of I'm human and so are you. And I found other people who felt the same way and that prevailed. And so I'm grateful for that. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Nikita. And I want to concur that um, with all the challenges that I did face, I feel that um, my military career, the time that I spent in the military, set such a solid foundation for me. And I would not be the man that I am today had I not gone and served. You know, Manny, you're, you're you know, speaking to the reality of of taking the circumstances that you were in and really building on it and really growing and learning. General Bivens, I know from some conversations that we have had that foundationally your career and what you did, you know, and what you're able to achieve and what you're able to learn and the example that you set now is so very, very important. And I think this is one of the most important things as we as a country, as we as a national community come together and commit ourselves to have a deeper conversation that it's important for folk who have not faced the challenges of discrimination to understand that all of the layers that are dealt with when you find yourself in a situation where merely because of the color of your skin that there are opinions and ideas that people form about you that along with other than the other regular challenges that all humanity have to deal with that that challenge in and of itself cuts deep. And I think the most important thing that we want people to know that, you know, our level of dedication and our level of desire to move forward. And unfortunately, many other folk who were the victims of those kinds of levels of discrimination who were not able to move forward, that it's important for us to collectively understand and feel our humanity in every instance of our life. I think that that's the importance in art and creative expression. You know, that whether you're you're looking at a play or you're you're looking in on someone's life and you get a chance to hear and feel a tender human element of who they are that touches you, that to the degree as a nation that we can understand and hear and feel each other's stories that we can really, really grow. And again, art is an important part of that. Uh, General Bivens, you and Manny and Nikita, you and of course, Alice um, and myself, we, we have all uh, had the good fortune of sharing in a conversation about creativity and how artistic expression can really help to enrich our lives. And so, you know, if we can in the next few minutes, just talk about that a little bit. You know, uh, General Bivens, certainly you've been at the at the head of the at the helm, uh, along with a, a lot of other folk from the arts community and the military community in terms of having the vision to understand the importance of art as a modality for healing. You know, you specifically talked a bit, or at least your bio speaks about, you know, traumatic brain in injury and, and you know, post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. But trauma, the trauma of, of exclusion <laughs> is a big one. And, 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 and being able to deal with and gain strength um, in those moments where you, of exclusion to gain the heart strength to continue to move on i can attest personally to the fact that music and art and creative expression was an important part of that um nikita we'll start with you how has art touched your life in a real positive way uh yeah oh wow so art my genuine love for art actually started while i was in the army I was introduced to it a bit before, but what really made the fact for me that this is so powerful, I had a family member that passed away while I was um, away in Maryland at Fort Meade, and 
I was really hurt. It, I took it really hard. And there was um, another soldier, a friend of mine, who took me, she just got me and just, you know how you just have those friends who just take you under their wing when they know you're hurting. And she did that and we, she took me to her church and they were having praise and worship rehearsals. So they were singing and dancing and, and it was a beautiful time. And I started to sing with them. And it was like, it was as if I was literally given medicine mm -hmm. as I started to sing. And I, I could feel the healing taking place as I opened my mouth and I let the notes come out. And there was a certain part of the rehearsal where they just let us flow and let us sing. And the more I sang, the more healing I felt come to my heart. And literally in my mind to this day, I see that moment as here, this gift of song is medicine for you. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward, Throughout my time in the military, I was able to sing at various events, um, different change of command ceremonies, always singing the national anthem or anywhere else I could lend my gift. So after I was able to leave the military in 2014, it, I went a certain period of time without really being engaged in art as I was making that transition. And it was really hard at first. Um, I myself have dealt with PTSD and depression and anxiety. And when I was able to connect with my brother Manny in 2018 and Fred in 2019 and starting with the Veteran Civilian Dialogues and that just reignited my love for the arts, for singing and for dancing. And it's like I was reminded sometimes you can be in that dark place and you can't see anything but whatever's right in front of you. It's like smoke and mirrors. And having that time to come back together in the art space was like the smoke was being removed. And it's like, no, remember this part of you, that medicine, you still got that medicine. And it's like, we were able to just share this time of just, first we would have our conversations where people with different levels of experience were able to talk and share. And then we would just burst out into song and dance and, and that space, literally, for me, it felt like going around giving out medicine. It felt like <laughs> <laughs> it felt like the sun shining just in the room. No matter what you came into the room with, you could literally walk out a different person. I didn't know how much I needed it. I ended up in the room just randomly. My brother called me maybe an hour prior to the event and said, hey, my brother Fred is doing this event. You want to go? Me and me and your sister are going. I said, okay, I guess so. I didn't have any clue what I was walking into, but when I walked out of that room, I knew I wanted more of what we had created. Yeah. And, and it's, it's the beautiful thing to get into a space, especially as a veteran coming out of the military. At first, you're like, where am I? What is this? It's, it's, it can be challenging to reintegrate into the rest of society, especially if you, you know, you may have challenges within your family or you have challenges with people understanding you and where you are now. But when you can get into a room with other people who get it and then be able to share that love for art, it, it really is reviving. It, it really just helped to bring me back to a place where I can even sit here now to talk and share the way that I do. So I'm very grateful for that. Wow, thank you. Thanks so much, Nikita. Manny? Yes, so I, I, uh, I am a recording artist. No, I'm just <laughs> um, So he, here's what happened to me. Um, Remember earlier I was talking about I was field artillery, the only job I ended up with. Um, so yeah, try 11 years, maybe more before going to a war, 11 or plus years, I don't remember the exact, of just training in field artillery, field artillery, field artillery. Let me tell you, I was the hardest person to get along with because I was it was a doctrine that was provided to me. This is how you gotta be, you walk around. I remember what my wife was, I would not hold my wife's hand if I was in uniform. 
it was that bad. Um, so here comes Iraq and we get ready to, to deploy to Iraq. So in artillery, we, we take our own pieces of equipment, but we, uh, we take a, a container, a Connex, and we fill it up with all kinds of stuff. And, and then we send the Connex and then we send the, the artillery piece. And as we're getting ready here, Sergeant Guevara, I mean, shiny boots, back when you shine boots, super pressed uniforms, looking straight and sharp, um, packing the Connex, using that hand movement that we do. Because that, that was, at that time, I, was, I, I had a little bit of rank. So that was me packing the Connex. <laughs> um, here comes this young PFC. Uh, I will keep his name out of this. But he did not look like me, and he did not look like Fred. He was one of those who happened to be not like me, but the recruiting station was looking for the same thing. Um, anyway, he comes up, and he has this Martin Traveler's guitar. It's about this big. It's about this wide. It's a Traveler's guitar. And I lose my mind. I'm like, private... <laughs> What in the hell you think you bring it up? Blah 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 blah. And I and I go and I go artillery on him. Blah 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 blah. Just barking at him. And he looks at me with with a, a, a bit of hippiness in his in his feeling. He goes, "You'll see, chief." And I lost my mind. What is this private talking about? First of all, you get a parade rest. Let me tell you something. If you don't, and then you go there. You know whatever. And then he goes parade rest, and he looks at me. He goes. You'll see, Chief. I was so flabbergasted by his audacity that I figured, you know what? Pack the darn guitar. We'll we'll talk about this later. So we pack the guitar away, whatever. When we get to Iraq, um, so I got to Iraq in the beginning of the war. So every night I was being shot at. That was it was you expected it. What I didn't expect is that that private he knew something and it was almost like time it, it, it was it was as if we can expect it you can see the sun at a certain level yeah he comes to the attack it's gonna happen and then we get the attack we buckle we cover we do whatever we gotta do <clears throat> and when the dust settled and for this i'm gonna use a little assistance <clears throat> When the dust, and I promise Alice, I won't sing. When the dust, as the dust is settling, I hear. And it somehow, that sound allowed the emotional wellness to come back to me going from being attacked to this. And it caught my attention. So I, I look for the sound. And when I find the sound, it was that private with that guitar. And he looks at me and smiles and he goes, I told you, Chief, you'll see. So there in that very moment, I learned to love the sound. It was the to go every night for 15 months. We would actually look forward to getting attacked because we knew that afterwards we'll come back to this. And in the middle of the field, we'll gather. So all of that happened in the middle of the war zone. <laughs> um, so I created, I, I somehow in my mind, I got wired to, to understand the guitar, the music, the arts as 
the two goal, the safety plan for whenever a crisis is taking place. Um, and then like my sister Nikita was saying, uh, years down the line, I mean, I picked up the guitar. I've been playing the guitar since, since 2004, I've been playing the guitar. Um, in 2000, she said the, the right, 18 and 19, I don't remember. No, it was 18, no, 19, I, one of those. Um, I, I, I reconnect with Fred and and because we have me and fred have met fred and i had met earlier because we want to do some so much work behind it but we never got the opportunity to but when we finally did it was just like nikita's experience fred calls me hey manny we doing this thing on this day and that day is tomorrow and in true bohemian style it's like i right, stop everything else Nothing else matters. We're going to stop what we're doing. I, I pick up the phone. I call my wife. I'm like, hey, mama, get your stuff ready. Come down to Tampa. And because uh, we're going to meet with my people over there. We, we, we're we going to do some things with music. And my wife been with me for 20 plus years. So she understand that bohemian. So when she, she sees that I get to that going, she's like, oh, but then I kind of felt some kind of way for her. I'm thinking, you know what? Is this going to be a bunch of dudes just banging real hard and, and drums and things and just going wild? And so I figured, let me call my sister. Hey, Nikita, we doing this thing? And she got a couple of hours before we started. Hey, Nikita, we got, we doing this thing with my friend Fred. And let me tell you, at the moment that we all came together, it was borderline divine. It was an experience that it wasn't judgmental at all. It wasn't one of those places where uh, I, I've done so much in my veteran career and the other guy saying, no, oh, I've done so much more. It wasn't that. It was straight looking at me for who I am. I am a human. And as a human, I need the connection with other humans. And there's one thing that will never be tampered with by language, numbers, uh, systems, or, or even races. And that is art. And that's how we all connected through that art. And unfortunately, uh, Fred got me hooked up with another set of instruments now, which by the way, yesterday, Fred, I just ordered my cajon Ah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just losing my mind now. I got a bunch of things in the house and I just look at them and I just bang them. The kids, they don't like it as much as I do, but the kids <laughs> hear the truth. I hear what I want to hear. They hear the truth, but I will get there. That's so great. That's so, so, so great. And, and both uh, Nikita and Manny were involved with a wonderful project that we did last year with the internationally renowned Diavolo Dance Company. It was a, an, an original piece of choreography designed specifically to tell the story and to honor veterans. And so it was a great, great, great experience. In the, in the, in the few minutes that we have left, you know, General Bivens, I'd love to, to you know, have you just share your journey now as a, as a retired general leading a conversation about the importance of art and artistic expression um, and you know, the, the importance of that engagement in healing and wholeness and health and, and really an alignment with our community. Well, this has been uh, so powerful and so uh, enriching um, at all kinds of levels. It, it in itself has been healing. And uh, I think that that's probably the touch point that I would share, Fred, with you. And I hope from the town halls that you, you see this as a part of the healing process itself, um, that the actual execution of the town hall or the presentation of it is done in the spirit of healing because as, as uh, they were talking, I, I began to, to understand, um, Nikita talked about this idea of humans seeing humans. That's a, that's a touchstone right there in the sense of the the lenses that I was that I, sh I was sharing with you earlier, um, 
we ultimately want to get to that lens where we do see each other as human. Unfortunately, like a battlefield, there's chaos, there's smoke, there's a lot of things that get between us in that lens of what we see. But ultimately, we are trying to clear that lens to, to wipe it with some compassion or wipe it as um, the, the, the notion of what Manny was talking about in, in this idea of what music did after the fire, fire fight. Um, it brought clarity back and we saw the human dimension of each other beyond that. My journey very quickly um, grew out of uh, leadership, but it really spurred by what a civilian experience of mine had been, particularly with music. I, uh, I knew a guy who, uh, at that time, I didn't think of it that way, but uh, he was very, very talented, rich uh, in his musical ability, and he, he was a master of the piano. And uh, I come to learn later, he was actually a therapist, but he was really, really, really talented. And there would be times when he'd play, and at, at that time, being on active duty very early in my career, but when he played, it was like, um, Nikita, I went to that place that you talked about, or Manny, as you talked about in the desert. It's like, I didn't even know I was experiencing it, but it's like, wow, I feel good. Fast forward almost uh, 15 years later, and as I was the, uh, the deputy commander general for fourth ID, we came back out of the war. I came back from Iraq. I joined the division um, there at Fort Hood. And I had a hearing therapist to share a story with me about how veterans would return from combat and they would do their post physicals and they would go through the hearing evaluation process. And many times as she would do the hearing test with them, they would become silent, non-responsive. She'd look inside of the hearing booth and when she looked inside of it, they'd be weeping and crying. And what had happened was as they come back from the war, they had the great celebrations, everybody welcomed them, they were appreciated, but that stuff that had been clogged up and held in just was still there. And when they got in that a booth, which was total silence, they had to face the man or the woman themselves and all of it began to outpour. She was concerned about how to help them. Well, when she presented me that story, in my role, I realized that we all of a sudden had potentially service members going back to war with wounds that if it was an external one, I'd see it, I could fix it. Hey, go down to the dock, get this done. But there was now in my awareness, something that was inside that I couldn't see even in my most caring way for as a commander. And I began a search for how to deal with that. I did not really pull it all together until I got towards the end of my career and understand based on a conversation with um, the, the president of Americans for the Arts that with one simple question he asked me one night, how can the arts be valuable to our service members as we go through this, uh, this period of war? And when he asked the question, I never thought about it in my life. It was like, uh, I was an infantry guy, right? I slept on the ground, that's all I did. And, and so what do you mean art? What's this that you're asking about, so to speak? But in the instance he asked that, I had this immediate recall of this friend of mine who played the piano. And I said, I don't know right now, Bob, but I will tell you, I think music would be a starting point. Right? And it was grown out of that experience of what it had done to me, even before my war experience and, and being in the military. I think that the, the real answer I'd like to give you, I think comes from this notion that we are constantly searching for the idea of being made whole. War and traumatic and trauma has a way of tearing us apart from what we think reality is. And I did some uh, reading about Odysseus and many soldiers that have gone to come back from the poetry side of it. I'm a writer, uh, I write, that's how I get my, my benefit uh, and recovery. And what I discovered was that you know, they were, this whole story of getting back from war to home is a journey of understanding how you reclaim that space of what you thought reality was. And, and I think this is why I'm so um, fascinated to see veterans now embracing this idea because culturally they want to heal. They want to heal on their own terms. They don't want to have any conditions set so that then they set themselves up as a weak person or not being able to help others. We are a very proud population. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the
proud population that want to serve others continuously and not see ourselves as being victims. I know that has helped me immensely. And, and I think it's in so many ways that uh, this topic now that we started out with in terms of race relations, you know, I, I, I took note of your comment about the Marine Corps, but see, the reason I kind of emphasize that point or why I think it came out to me in my research was that the first guy to take me and pull me aside and tutor me as a young general officer was a Marine general. That's how far the Marine has come, right? So it's all about getting better. And that metaphor of the lenses is not just for an individual, while it's very appropriate, it's also for an institution. And I can say that they, the institutions see us differently. And as long as we kind of continue to perpetuate where we want to go, but not lose that human to human, as Nikita so well said, we all want to see each other as human eventually, I think. And if we can get to that point and take the smoke, get the lenses cleaned off, wipe them off a little bit, I think we'll be there. Um, it's certainly a factor that's made my life uh, better uh, as a result of being in the military. And I'm appreciative for so many uh, service members, fellow service members from privates to, to generals that have enabled me to be a better person because of that experience. I hope that guided some of your answers there. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, General Bivens. General Bivens and Manny and Nikita, thank you so very, very much. Um, uh, when Alice and I have, have gone through some of the questions that people have sent in um, over the last few months, one of the questions was, well, how can the, what can the performing arts do uh, to, to make our country better, to make this situation where we seem to not understand e each other enough? What, what can the performing arts center do? I think this is a perfect example, a perfect example of creating a forum where we can come together and be truthful with each other we can learn about each other. We can honor each other. We can forgive the things that we don't know. And we can recognize that all of us, if we give ourselves the chance, can really move far, far, far beyond our imaginings if we're willing to work and do that, which is for the greater good. And certainly your dedication, um, all of you, um, is so greatly appreciated. I'm, I'm honored to, to sit with you as a veteran. I'm honored to sit with you as an artist, and I'm honored to sit at an institution where we're really dedicated to continuing to tell the story. To all of our veterans throughout the country and their families, we honor you. We're thankful. We recognize and realize the great sacrifice and commitment that you all have made. Um, to those who have lost loved ones, we hold you in our hearts forever. We honor you as well and do everything that we can to honor and uphold the great sacrifice, the great commitment that everyone who raises their hand and commits their service to this country. Together, we can be stronger. Together, we can be better. Again, General Nolan Vivens, thank you. Manny Govera, thank you. Nikita Wilson, thank you. As always, Alice Santana, thank you. And thank you to our interpreters who help us to make sure that everyone can feel and understand what we communicate. On behalf of the Strad Center for the Performing Arts, I'm Fred Johnson. Be safe, stay strong. And tomorrow, November 20, come Riverwalk at the Strad Center for the Performing Arts and hear Nikita Wilson sing. All right. Be with us. <laughs> Stay strong, everybody. Take care. Bye bye for now. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.